Okay. Okay. So um, I'm going to start by just you know, let's play. I'm going to start by talking about mapping. Now I'm going to start with no more. This was left over from the last time. Um, uh, or also known as association of ideas. Now, it's funny because uh, Later on, and in some ways, the school traced itself back to Locke. There was a school called Associationism, which said that the whole way all thinking works is by association of ideas. <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, Locke says that association of ideas is um, is madness. Um, and, he, and he says, uh, so this is book three. Which one do I right. Four. Oh, sorry, it is right, but it's book two. Okay. Book two, chapter 33. Because um, I was thinking, book three doesn't have 32 chapters, but it's, so it's still in book two. All right. So, uh, section four on page 354. Um, I shall be pardoned for calling it by so harsh a name as madness when it is considered that opposition to reason deserves that name and is really madness. Um, so apparently the objection to calling association of ideas. Now, I mean, I'm not saying exactly what association of ideas is, but it's somehow that like when you get one idea, another one comes with it. Um, and and uh, Locke says this is madness, and then he says, um, well, uh, you're probably going to object to my calling this madness. And it seems like, the well, I mean, it's clear, the objection is on the part of the sane person saying it's too harsh. Um, you know, uh, like, I'm just doing this thing that everyone does associating ideas and how dare you call it madness. But, you know, I mean, we can first imagine the um, like insane or mentally ill person also accepting to this and saying, uh, um, you're trivializing my problems, something like that. Um, uh, you know, this I'm not sure if this is the best thing to imagine them saying or not. I can't imagine them saying something like this anyway. Like, you know, this isn't my fault. I'm mentally ill. Uh, you know, how dare you compare this to this kind of like everyday blunder that everyone makes and imply that I'm just making a mistake. Um, so, like, I think to both of them, Locke is saying, you're not as different from each other as you think. <laughs> right? Like, uh, um, the, the, the line between the supposedly sane and the supposedly insane is, is not very sharp. Right? As he says right after that, um, part that I read, there is scarce a man so free from it 
but that if he should always on all occasions argue or do as in some cases he constantly does, would not be thought fitter for bedlam than civil conversation. Right, so he's saying like, um, um, we all have, uh, or almost all, there is scarce any man, right? So we all have certain occasions, or sorry, there are certain, for each of us, there are certain cases in which we constantly do something. Right, so it's not just like a sudden impulse or something. We constantly do this in certain cases. And if we did the same thing in all cases, we would be committed. Um, and she says that, in fact, he first started thinking about association of ideas because he was trying to understand the causes of madness. <laughs> Um, now, like, I mean, whether it's true, it seems unlikely that all of the many things that we call madness or mental illness are like all explained by this thing that Locke is calling association of ideas. I mean, even if, if there even is such a thing, um, but, uh, um, but, uh, But I think uh, the importance of this from Locke's point of view is that what, you know, basically he's claiming that this is a fundamental source of irrationality, therefore opposition to reason, which you can call madness, and then it's extremely common. Yeah. I was just uh, clarifying when we say association of ideas, it is not referring to like what most people would consider ideas. It's Locke's definition of ideas, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what, like, what, like, what the, most people call ideas where you're going on. Well, I mean, like, I'm not sure everyone would, like, define ideas the same way Locke would. No, for sure not, but I'm just like, but what, like, what particular problem is it? Does that lead us to him? Oh, no, I'm just saying, like, when he says association of ideas, it would be, like, his ideas in particular. Yeah. Yeah, and so as he explains, and that's why, like, I wanted, I definitely wanted to say something about this, not go on without saying anything about this section, because I think this, like, it's a, important to understand this section or understand what he's going to say about the use of language in book three and what he's going to say about the reasoning process in book four. And um, um, because the reason this is like a fundamental source of opposition to reason or irrationality um, is, and also the reason it's very common, he explains both of those in the next section on page 355. Um, some of our ideas have a natural correspondence and connection one with another. It is the office and excellency of our reason to trace these and hold them together in that union and correspondence, which is founded in their peculiar beings. Um, right, so um, reason is what is going to allow us to put our ideas in the right order in which they <laughs> like have some natural correspondence with each other. Now, like what is what is this connection that I'm that I'm you know symbolizing by these little lines of arrows here? So uh, I think. The answer is, and this is an example of what you're supposed to do in the first writing assignment. I'm not sure. <laughs> it, I mean, it certainly means at least those um, ne visible necessary connection between ideas, between the ideas of primary qualities that we've discussed in the past and then we come back in, in book four. And so 
so reason in, in laying them out in this right order with this connection between them is what allows us to do um, geometrical leaps, for example, according to law. Um, so we'll see more in book four about how that works, but it's basically like the thought is that you want to know whether some proposition is true, like uh, the angles of a triangle. Equal two right angles. Well, actually, equal should go in here. So that... Right? You want to know if these two ideas agree with each other. One idea is the idea of the interior angles of the triangle, and the other is the idea of two right angles. And we want to know do these ideas agree with each other in degree? And the way we find out is, well, sometimes, in some cases, we could just look at the two ideas and so to speak, see if they agree with each other. But if we can't, we have to find other ideas that go between them. Yeah. So does, it, does abstraction kind of divide madness, like, like madness and its association of ideas, and there's like abstraction on the other side? It, um, I see, like, I understand why you're asking that. And it's, it's a connection that I've worried about in the past, how it's supposed to work out exactly. But, I mean, so like, it's- Like is abstraction just not like the same thing as madness, but not going, like being able to make logical connections versus some sort of- well, I, I thought you meant is it the opposite, right? Because abstraction is what allows us to take ideas apart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, and you know, that's important because I guess like the question is, um, are infants before they are able to perform abstraction and non-human animals, are, are they doing this? And then uh, is that a kind of insanity? I mean, so I think the answer is no. <laughs> um, but um, that this association of ideas is it's not the same as the way we naturally associate ideas because we like correctly regard them as having all come in at the same time together. Um, so, like, if you only have ideas of particulars, um, you, you know, um, when you think of a particular snowball, you think of all its qualities and having been there at a certain time and a certain place and having affected you that. And that's right, there's no madness in that. Ray, like, they did all come together then. Now it's true, they don't have the kind of unity that we give to our complex ideas when we voluntarily put the ideas together, right? They like came in together involuntarily, but I'm not wrong that they went together. So, I mean, the, the wrong thing is when later I get one of them and I think the other ones have to come this time too. <laughs> Right, so so like this actually is like a post abstraction problem, basically. You know, like it's it's like after I have an idea that can that it can apply many many instances, um, then nevertheless I start to think that it has to always come with another one in every instance. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Anyway, right, so there's a natural order of ideas. So one natural order of ideas is the one that we know between primary qualities that allows us to do arithmetic and geometry. But I think Locke also, although some of the things he says here about they're going together by their own peculiar being or whatever, don't quite fit with this. 
but I think he means also because he's going to say in book four there's also an order of ideas that we use to form probable conclusions. So that he's not going to count those as knowledge. Right? But like, uh, you know, um, things that we might usually say we know, like there's a place called China and a lot of people live there is one of his examples. <laughs> right? So he's, you know, he says, um, I don't know that by um, present sensation or memory. I've never been there. And I can't give a demonstrative proof of it, like in geometry, but it's very probable. And to determine that it's very probable, I put certain ideas in a certain order. And, um, you know, like, uh, a lot of people have told me there's such a place. I've read about it in all kinds of books. You know, so then from that, you have to get to it being true. And you put in stuff like people don't usually lie about stuff like that. It would be a weird conspiracy if everyone were, you know, like whatever, right? So, so, so that's, you know, there's a kind of argument here, but the, but the things that go between the ideas and the different ideas in the argument are not like necessary connections, but like, Given this, this is probable. Meaning, probable doesn't. Well, anyway, I shouldn't go too far, too much into this. But I mean, so the, the it's important whether he's including that also because it's, you know. So how do we reach those? How do ideas get those probable connections between them? Well, it's because we we like experience things happening together over and over. So it's kind of like this association of ideas. And in fact, you know, Hume is gonna say that um, it's the same thing. And if you say like, um, Hume, are you saying that all our knowledge and that facts beyond our own experience is madness? He's gonna say, well, it's not rational. It's not reason that causes us to believe that. But um, but I think Locke is, and you know how he wants to, to work out the details of this, I don't know, but I think Locke is distinguishing between the legitimate way of putting ideas together based on long experience. And which as long as you realize that you don't have demonstrative proof is perfectly rational. So, you know, um, distinguishing between that and idea of getting lumped together, you know, sometimes based on just one time that they came together. Or anyway, not based on the kind of like careful experiment that would determine they really go together, right? So like, like for example, Locke talks, you know, he does an example he heard of, of this guy who learned how to dance. I think this isn't designed reading. I'm not sure. Maybe not. The guy who learned how to dance, and he, but the, and he learned how to dance very well. But the room he learned how to dance in had this had a trunk in the corner, and then afterwards he was only able to dance in that room. Or if he was somewhere else, they had to bring a trunk and put it in the corner. <laughs> right. And then you know the point is that like. Uh, he didn't, so to speak, do a controlled experiment in which he determined that the trunk in the corner was an important part of making the right dance move. <laughs> um, he uh, just like put them together without rational, without any rational, I wanna say rational reason, but that's obviously redundant, right? <laughs> without any reason, he just put them together. And ever afterwards, he couldn't take them apart. Um, similarly, I, like I'm told that when I was a baby, I choked on a piece of cottage cheese, and even though like I, I've never been a picky eater. I like one thing I've never liked is cottage cheese. <laughs> oh. 
So I don't remember this, but like apparently that, you know, so again, it's not like through long experience of cottage cheese, I learned that it makes me choke and now I don't want to eat it. It's just like one time, the thing that made me choke happened to be cottage cheese. And now without even being able to say why, I don't like the way it tastes. Um, okay, so, you know, um, that's what he's talking about. This, so the result of this madness is we put ideas in the wrong order. We connect them the wrong way. And we can't be convinced of our error by arguments. Right? Like you couldn't convince me to like cottage cheese by like, I mean, I know perfectly well that, that cottage cheese isn't more likely to make you choke than other foods. But it doesn't matter because I can't separate. The like the I, the idea of pain or unpleasantness from the from that taste. So like every time in your argument, so to speak, you mention one of them, the other one comes to. <laughs> so like I can follow the whole argument, but in the conclusion, when you say it's so cottage cheese is safe, when I think of cottage cheese, the idea of unpleasantness comes right back. <laughs> right. So um um, okay, I'm not sure what else to say about this for the moment, except that I guess uh, one other thing that's interesting that, about this is that uh, this is exactly also what Spinoza says the root of irrationality. We, there's one order of ideas that goes according to reason, and it's another that goes according to our imagination. And he even gives the same explanation that Locke, this is one of those places where he um, momentarily veers into natural philosophy. And he says, um, Custom settle ha settles habits of thinking in the understanding as well as of determining in the will and of motions in the body, all which seems to be but trains of motion in the animal spirits, which once set a, set a going are worn into a smooth path and the motion in it becomes easy and as it were natural. So notice it gives the same explanation of how, why the imagination starts to do this. Um, and the animal spirits are like, It's supposed to be a very tenuous fluid that flows through the nerves and like connects the it, it, and, and flows around inside the brain, right? Like all these people talk, it's actually an Aristotelian concept that's in the parts of animals or whatever, but uh, but all these modern people, early modern people, you know, Descartes talks about animal spirits and all that. Um, you know, so I mean, it's not that far off. Something flows in those ions. <laughs> anyway, so uh, that's the, ex the explanation is how this happens. And it's interesting because now when Locke like leaves off his usual abstraction from these questions and actually says how he thinks it works, you can see that he thinks a lot, at least, of. Uh, the, the things that happen in our, in our mind are like dependent on things that happen in our brain. The reason the two ideas get associated is that the animal spirits like somehow wear out a track. And then once they're once they have that track worn out, they always flow that way. All right. Anyway, that's probably more time than I should have spent. Are, are there more questions about madness? Okay, so now I'm going to go on to talk about book three about words. So, um, the title of chapter 10 of book three is of the abuse of words. And I'm starting by talking about that because um, abuse, like, um, 
the abuse of something is a use of it. Right? Like you can't abuse words without using them. It's a use of it, but it's not the property. That's what that abuse of something. Right? So the abuse of words, so just that title implies two different things. Words have a proper use, and they have other uses that are not properties, that are abuses. Um, And so, you know, in, when in the remainder of chapter 10, he goes on to criticize, like many, what he says in many cases about abuse of words of one kind or another is that this rend renders language useless. Um, he has to mean um, it doesn't contribute to any proper use of language. It doesn't mean you're not using it for something. And I think, like, you can see this clearly in section seven to eight, where he's criticizing the, um, so again, this is uh, book three, chapter 10, section seven, page 440. So he's criticizing the um, the uh, the type the way of using words that's encouraged by the scholastic emphasis on disputation, right? So that you know the scholastics um, meaning scholastic means like the later part of Latin medieval philosophy, when philosophy was done in universities. Those are the scholastics. Um, so the, you know, the scholastics were, uh, put a lot of emphasis on the ability to um, win in a dispute. So a question would be posed and someone would, you know, would argue one side and someone else would argue the other side. And it was like, it's very important to be able to win. Um, um, there is, maybe it's a little bit less now than it used to be. There's very much emphasis on that in contemporary philosophy also, right? Like if you're hiring someone, if you're trying to decide who to hire, you'll like bring the last, few candidates that you're trying, you're trying to decide between, you bring them in and you have to give a talk and then people ask questions. And it's like an important issue about how well the candidate did is how well they filled with the questions. That's very much like what the scholastics had to do. At least it is if the questions are hostile, which they often are. Although, like I said, maybe that's changing a little bit. Um, so, um, I think that's why people say, are always say, saying things like, this is just a clarificatory question because normal questions are supposed to be attacks. <laughs> right? So if you're just asking them to clarify themselves, you're not attacking them. So you, yeah, but anyway, um, right. Uh, whether that has the effects that Locke is saying it has on contemporary philosophy, whether it had that effect on the scholastics themselves, I'm not sure. But in any case, so that's what he's criticizing. And he says, so he says that this like way of judging people or awarding honor and uh, and perhaps you know money as well, right? Like who's going to get hired? Um, he says uh, this promotes the skill to perplex, involve, and subtilize the signification of sounds so as never to want something to say in opposing or defending any question. The victory being adjudged not to him who had truth on his side, but the last word in the dispute. So, um, um, and, you know, so first of all, this already indicates something about what the proper order of words is going to be. 
so, so the proper use of words. We want the words to um, express the natural order between ideas that we were just talking about. So if the words can do that, then the listener can um, reconstruct the argument and get to the right conclusion. Um, and so uh, in that case, the last word in the argument would be the truth. Right? Like what you say at the end, you know, A is B and B is C and C is D, therefore A is D. That's the last word in the argument and it's the truth. But um, but this uh, emphasis on dispute um, promotes the skill of like um, using your words to make it sound like ideas can go together in whatever order you want, <laughs> and then the last word will be the one that you the side that you're on, and you'll be judged to have won. Right. So, um, so that's that's what he's talking about. And then he says at the beginning of the next section, section eight, this though a very useless skill, and that which I think the direct opposite to the ways of knowledge hath yet passed hitherto under the laudable and esteemed names of subtlety and acuteness, etc. So, so the ability to do this with your words to like. To make it sound like certain ideas go together, even though they don't, um, is very useless. But um, it's not literally useless. We just heard what it's useful for. It's useful for winning disputes. <laughs> right? This skill is very useful if what you want to do is win disputes. And if that's the basis on which rewards are being given out, um, and you want rewards, I mean, that's the whole idea of rewards, that you want them, <laughs> right? So, like, if that's the basis on which rewards are, going, are being given out, then it's useful for you to have this skill. So why is this use not a proper use? That right, because that must be the answer. This use is this, yeah, you're using it for something, but it's an abuse. It shouldn't be used for that. It shouldn't be used to win disputes. Why? And I think Locke answers it towards the end of section eight, or you could tell the answer towards the end of section eight. He says, um, whilst it appears in all history that these profound doctors were no wiser nor more useful than their neighbors, and brought but small advantage to human life or the societies wherein they lived. So in other words, Locke is connecting this back to what we saw with the principle of his ethics. The proper use of language is the one that's useful for to society. It can be useful for me to win dispute, but it's not useful to society, and therefore it's not what I should do. And um, and it will be punished according to the divine law <laughs> if I use words this way, right, for my own advantage to the detriment of society. And it ought to be condemned by the law of virtue, right? That is, it ought to be not the basis of admiration but of disapproval whether it ought to be condemned by the civil law is another question um i think Locke is going to try to explain why no even though this is bad it shouldn't be prohibited by the civil law um but for you know but for example hobbes would say yes <laughs> right like the a wise ruler of the Commonwealth will make this type of scholastic wrangling elite. Um, okay, so um, so anyway, so so that's so the proper use of words. It's not really something specific to words. 
the proper use of words is the same as the proper use of anything, namely the what's so the socially useful use of words. Um, so what is the social usually use of words? Um, so Locke says, um, Locke in several places mentions two uses of words. Um, one is for recording my own thoughts. He doesn't talk about this that often, but he talks about it consistently, like there's a number of different places where he says, in addition to uh, the second use was I'm going to write, it's also useful for recording my own thoughts, right? So like, so that just involves me and I just want to mark for what I thought yesterday so I can bring it back easily and I use words for that. But um, this, so, I mean, this isn't, bad per se, but it's it's for my own use. Right? It's I mean, it's not detrimental to society in itself. So there's nothing bad about it, but it's just it's for my own use. So it'll be good if I'm doing good things and bad if I'm doing bad things. Right. Um, the social use of language is and actually instead of class, I should probably say ideas. I'm for my own ideas. Again, in Locke's technical sense of ideas. So the social use of language is communication of ideas. According to Locke. I mean, I'm saying according to Locke because it's not clear that that's the, that's the only or the main social function of language, but that's what Locke says it is. Um, so how does this work? Well, so, you know, there's two people, here's the speaker and here's the listener. Um, So the speaker is going to produce a certain sound. Um, and like we can call this sound um, like small s. Now, I mean, it doesn't really matter what that sound is. Um, uh, but uh, um, Or I guess I should say it doesn't really doesn't matter how the speaker makes that sound. Like we actually most of the time don't know how we make the sound we make when we're talking. Um, right? Like what you have to do with your tongue, let alone why that makes that sound or whatever. So, but um, but this this is a sound that the speaker can make voluntarily, which means the speaker can. Uh, have the idea of this sound. They're calling it, I think I should have made the speaker and the listener bigger. Um, the speaker can have the idea of that sound. And then based on that idea, by some process that we don't understand and it doesn't really matter how it works, they make that sound. Right, so that's what it means that they, they make that sound voluntarily. They have the idea of the sound together with a volition or somehow, right? Like they have the idea of that sound together with the desire that they're actually used up the sound and, you know, presto, there is such a sound. <laughs> okay, and the speaker is making this sound because The speaker has a, some other idea, X. And they want the listener to have the idea X. Now, I think like, um, 
It's not, there's a little bit more to it than that. I don't know if Locke is thinking about this more or not, though. But it's, I want this listener to have the idea X together, like attributed to me. <laughs> right? So, like, if I want you to have the idea of whiteness, the easiest way to do it is to just hold something white up in front of your face. Um, but that doesn't count as communicating my idea of whiteness to you. Like you have to have this idea kind of like somehow coming from me. Like I said, I'm not sure Locke is thinking about that as much. So I'm not going to talk about it more. But the, so the speaker wants, this is why it's called communication of ideas. The speaker wants their idea X to end up in a listener. So, um, So somehow, so what the listener actually hears is, of course, this sound, small s. Um, and then again, by a process we don't understand, that results in the listener having this, having the idea of that sound, big S. So the speaker has, you know, like the speaker makes the sound. Speaker has the idea of the sound white. On that basis, the speaker makes that sound. That sound travels to the listener. And if the listener is listening, then they'll get that idea, the idea of the sound white. But first, what the speaker wanted the listener to have is not the idea of the sound white, but the idea of whiteness. Um, so, um, somehow the listener has to infer um, this idea X, which they get from perception, that the speaker has the idea X. So what is the connection between these two ideas, X and S? Right, like again, my example, X is the idea of whiteness. Like whatever it is that's the immediate object of the mind when you see something white. And the idea of S is the idea of a certain sound, white. Um, how are those two ideas connected with each other? So, there's certainly no natural connection here. I mean, for sure not in the strong sense that somehow there's like a visible necessary connection between these two ideas, right? So that this inference that the listener makes would be like a geometrical proof. You know, the speaker emitted the sound, therefore the speaker had this idea S, therefore the speaker had the idea S, QED. Right, they're certainly not connected that way, but they're not even connected uh, naturally in the sense that, like, X is the natural cause of S, as we've learned from experience, or something like that. Um, I mean, compare this to the case of blushing, right? So, in the case of blushing, um, if I see someone blushing, I can infer something about what they're feeling, which like Locke would analyze as what idea they have in their mind, right? They have an idea of, you know, shame or embarrassment or whatever. So like, on what basis do I, do, do I make that inference? Well, it's not a geometric proof. Right, it's not like it's um, somehow necessary from just inspecting the idea of blushing and the idea of shame that they go together, but it's from experience. Yeah, uh, rather than necessary, could you argue that it makes it probable? Yeah, it makes it probable. Yeah, I mean that's 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 what Locke would use for this, right? So he would say that it's, you know 
that I don't have, I don't literally have knowledge that the other person is blush is uh, is embarrassed based on this blushing, but I can infer, I can make a probable inference from the blushing to the feeling of embarrassment, right? So that would be a weaker kind of natural connection, but there's no connection like that here either. Right, because um, if there were, everyone would speak the same language. Um, but uh, they don't, there's thousands of languages. <laughs> right, so we certainly haven't learned from experience that this sound always goes with this idea. Um, So maybe this is just the connection that the speaker and the listener have made by habit, right? Like they've so often heard this sound at the same time as this idea that they've come to associate them, even though there isn't really even a probable connection between them, right? So, I mean, uh, Locke does think something like that can happen, of course, but we just saw that he thinks it's Calls it madness. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, so that suggests that the language, however useful it is, um, is always dangerous, basically. I, and I think that, you know, this is behind at least some of the abuses of, or imperfections of language, not abuses that Locke talked about, that um, um, we very easily start to um, associate these two ideas together instead of inferring one from the other the way we should be, we start to be unable to separate. And then we get into all kinds of trouble, the, the kind of trouble that Locke expresses by saying that we mix up words and things. Right, but that's so, I mean, so Locke does think that that happens, but he, but he doesn't think that's the way it should be. So how should it work? So the answer is that the connection is supposed to be voluntary. That is, um, I'm supposed to have voluntarily adopted a rule by which, now, of course, the rule isn't whenever I have this idea X, I'll admit this sound, right? Because I always say I don't go around saying white every time I see something white. <laughs> so it's something much more complicated than that. But it's some kind of rule based on the basis of which I, um, when I have this idea in certain circumstances, I emit that sound. Or that is, there's some kind of rule on the basis of which when I have this idea under certain circumstances, I have this idea for each, along with a volition. And that's why I emit the Right, but again, like that part we don't understand. The, the, you know, like what we're talking about here, what what goes on inside my mind, and then how that results in the sound actually existing in the world is not, of course, to be determined. Um, so the rule that I've adopted is something like: when I get this idea, then I deliberately introduce this other idea. Not by inference, uh, it, but and also not by association, by habit, um, but like because I have um, voluntarily consented to a certain rule, um, and that's why uh, in chapter two, section two. So back towards the beginning of book three, which is on page 364. When he represents to himself other men's ideas by some of his own, 
if he consent to give them the same names that other men do, to still to his own ideas. So, like, there's other things going on in that sentence that, that, that I'm not talking about yet, but right, he's, he's saying that. Um, Meaning something by my words involves consenting to your certain rules. And I mean, I guess I should say, what, like, why does consent come in here? It's, this isn't, this rule isn't going to be a good rule to adopt unless there's a corresponding rule in the list. Right? Because what I want to do is communicate my idea to the list. So we have to. I mean, this, of course, this isn't exactly the same rule. They're like in the opposite direction or whatever, but they 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 go they go together, right? So um, um, so like in order for this communication to be possible, we have to consent in common to a certain rule that they're gonna, we're going to follow, and that's what he's talking about there when he says, "If he consent to give them the same names that other men do." Right to speak a language that can be socially useful is to consent to give the same names to my ideas that some other people. Have. So um, this actually, so before I said the question of the proper use of language is turns out to only be a special case of, of Locke's general question about ethics. Um, so like the, the, these rules that we adopt here turn out to be only a special case of Locke's views about politics. The rules have to be adopted by the consent of the government. Right? So, like, we have to agree in common to this rule so that this association will be voluntary. If it's not voluntary, it's irrational. Now, I mean, so you can ask, so, so in other words, this is, it's not just analogous to a social contract between the speaker and the listener. It literally is part of the social contract of the speaker and the listener are part of it, right? It's for the purpose of public utility. They've consented to these arbitrary rules, arbitrary up to a point, right? Like, I mean, they have to, they have to define a language that people are capable of speaking. So they couldn't be just anything. Um, but uh, on the other hand, up at some point they're arbitrary, and that's what we've consented to to form one political society. Um, and you know, you can uh, you can ask the same question about this that that. Um, that always comes up in the case of social contracts in general, which is, well, wait, when did I give that consent? Right? Like, I mean, in this case, it's clear it was it's this in this case, it's clear that it didn't happen because it's impossible, right? Like we can't sit down a child who doesn't speak our language yet and say, okay, these are the rules of our language. Do you consent to them? <laughs> you have to already speak a language to do that, right? So obviously that's not the way it works. Where does this consent come from? And Locke's answer in this case is the same as his general answer. This is um, in book three, chapter two, section eight, and 366. Is true common use by a tacit consent appropriate certain sounds to certain ideas in all languages? Tacit consent is Locke's solution to this question in the case of social contract in general in the second treatise, right? Like just having lived under a certain government and benefited from it, whatever, without having said anything. That's what right tacit means silence. Without having said anything. 
um, you can be presumed to assent to it. And that's the, and he's, he's invoking that exact same thing here. So what's happening when the listener infers this idea X, it's because from the idea S, it's because they're presuming the tacit consent of the speaker to this rule. And when the speaker tries to achieve their aim by, by emitting this sound, it's because they're presuming the tacit consent of the listener. Um, Okay, so therefore, according to Locke, the proper use of ideas, sorry, the proper use of words um, is to serve as signs of other ideas. In this particular sense of sign or sign of, namely that they follow those other ideas according to a um, certain conventional order that we've consented to. Um, which can be called a grammar or syntax. Now, I mean, I'm not talking about the grammar or syntax of the language here. I'm talking about the grammar or syntax of ideas according to which this one goes after, this idea goes after that idea. Um, right, we've, um, um, according to Locke, we've tacitly consented to a system of rules for interchanging some ideas for others in certain circumstances. We're having a certain kind of idea after another kind of idea in certain circumstances. And um, the, the correct following of this idea by this idea is what we mean by saying that this idea is a sign of this one. Um, so, I mean, you could call this uh, like a syntactic sign. I don't even know if this is a commonly used phrase or not, but um, um, that you know, one thing can be a sign of another in the sense that um, it it's a valid consequence of the other, according to like maybe I shouldn't use the word valid. It's a, it's a correct consequence of the other in, you know, according to the rules that I'm using for, for putting one thing after another. Um, maybe it will be clearer or maybe not when I say like what I'm contrasting this with. So, because Locke says that words are signs and ideas are also signs. Now, when he says words are signs, I mean, it's, I think it's really the idea of the words that are signs, right? Like, because again, like I can't exactly have a grammar according to which this idea is followed by this sound. Because although this sound falls on my volition, I don't understand how, right? So what I really have a rule for is following this idea with this idea. But, you know, okay, like ignore that for a second. So the point is, we can think either of this sound or of this idea as a word, and um, um, what was the of thing? oh, right. So Locke says words are signs, but Locke says ideas are also signs, meaning like this idea X itself is a sign. But what is it a sign of? So suppose it's the idea white. So it's a sign of, Locke says, the quality of white in the external object. 
quality of whiteness, the power, which is the power to cause me to perceive this idea. Now, obviously, I haven't adopted a conventional grammar according to which this idea follows this. I haven't consented to that. That's in no way under my control. Um, this, in other words, this quality is not part of my language. I mean, again, it's confusing because I'm talking about language here, but I'm also talking about a language that consists in, in like putting my ideas inside me in the right order. <laughs> it's not the language I'm speaking. And the point is this quality isn't part of that, right? It's not one of the things I can arrange into order. So like this sign refers to something outside of the language. Um, and it does it not because of some rules uh, of the language, but just for some other reason. Like, what's the reason? I mean, what doesn't really explain why? We, you know, I'm not sure it's the kind of thing that could be explained, but he just says that, you know, every idea is the idea of the quality that is the power to cause me to perceive it. Um, so I'm going to call this a semantic sign. And right with, I mean, so for those of you who haven't encountered these terms before, like at least with certain purposes, you can think of, of like symbols in a language as having two kinds of relations. One is a relation to the other symbol. And it, you know, it, you know, it has to do with questions like which ones are you allowed to write next to each other, and you know, so that that could like first of all have to do with how you can form a correct sentence or whatever, but also can be extended to to like what sentence you're allowed to write after another sentence. Yeah. Does Locke say? <coughs> excuse me. Does Locke say that like these things are given? Um... I guess these signs arbitrarily, like how you know, like the word for tree is different in English, Spanish, you know, like different languages. Like, does he say that it's arbitrary, or is there a specific reason in which we are connecting that kind of, um, you know, like specific word to a specific, I guess, you know, not a, a sign, I guess, you, yeah. think, you know? No, no, he's saying it's arbitrary, right? Okay. We've adopted, uh, I mean, I, I was saying before, it's not completely arbitrary, right? Like, but what I mean by that is like, there's no language the word for tree is, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, that's not a suitable sound for a word, you know, whatever, right? So, like, it's not completely arbitrary, but within the bounds of, you know, like what's humanly usable is arbitrary. Which, I mean, of course, saying it's arbitrary doesn't mean there isn't a reason we, we adopted that, right? Like there's a historical reason. Um, you know, but uh, but it, it that 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 historical reason doesn't show any kind of natural connection between the ideas. Yeah. Um, right. So what I was saying is like the symbols in a language, and here I'm thinking of the ideas in my mind as symbols in the language. The symbols in the language have a relationship to each other, according to which they can, you know, what's the right order you can write them in. Um, but they also at least you might think, have a relation to something outside the language, which is completely different, um, which is they're referring to something. Um, so like that's part of or kind of the same as the distinction people make between syntax and semantics as different ways of looking at a language. Right, and looking at it as a structure of symbols that can be written in something certain orders and not others, and versus looking at it as a system of symbols that refer to something outside the language. So, and what I'm saying is, according to Locke, words are syntactic signs of other ideas. It's just like they grammatically follow the other ideas, so to speak. Um, but the ideas themselves 
are semantic signs of the qualities of the external object. They refer to them, they're about them. Um, so, like, why am I emphasizing this? I think the main reason I'm emphasizing this is that we'll see when we get to Barclay that um, Barclay basically denies that there is such a thing as a reference. <laughs> um, well, it's a little more complicated than that, but because um, there is a way in which Barclay thinks that all our, all our ideas signify something, but they basically they they all signify the will of a, a spirit, either our own or God's will, you know. So anyway, I mean, we'll get to that more when we talk about Barclay. But but essentially, Barclay denies that there's such a thing as reference. And if you say, well, what's the relationship of this idea of whiteness to a quality in external body? Barclay will say there are no external bodies. <laughs> there are only signs that I move around in my head. Um, um, okay, so that's one, one reason to emphasize this is just like to, to uh, prepare for the upcoming contest with Barton. But, um, But it's also, I'm also emphasizing it to explain what Locke says. Um, so this is book three, chapter two, section four, on page 365. Um, Words as they are used are by men can properly and immediately signify nothing but the ideas that are in the mind of the speaker. So this is, I mean, like the central thesis and which of book three, which I already um, said, but maybe I didn't emphasize it enough, is right, the proper use of words is as signs of ideas. And now Locke is saying, and in fact, that's the only thing they can signify. The only thing they can be signs of is ideas, which ideas, the ideas in the mind of the speaker. So if I, you know, if I use this word as a sign of my idea X, then when I say that word, it means the idea X. Um, and, um, um, and he means, like, at first, maybe that seems kind of obvious until you realize how strictly he means it, right? Like, he describes a child growing up, and first, when they first learned the word gold, they, um, only notice the yellow color of gold. And so they use the word gold as a sign of that idea of that yellow color. And Locke says, when they say gold, that's what it means. Um, so, and then the process that happens after that, which we would usually describe as like the child learning what the word gold means. Locke describes as the child changing the meaning of his word gold. <laughs> the paint, like redefining it, basically. Um, now, I mean, obviously it's doing that because it's trying to adopt the same uh, rule that everyone around it is adopting, so we'll be able to communicate with it. Um, but nevertheless, Locke says, like, there's no state where it's literally um, 
doesn't mean what it says by the word goal. It always means exactly what it says. Because this is the only thing the word goal can immediately signify. So, um, um, now, like, something that, that should seem kind of weird. Um, and Locke says, it does seem kind of weird because um, we're always trying to get our ideas to do more than that. So this again is on page 365. So oh, it's right after the part I was reading before, in section four. But the words, I'll read what I read before again and then keep reading. But the words as they are used by men can properly and immediately signify nothing but the ideas that are in the mind of the speaker. Yet they and their thoughts give them a secret reference to two other things. So like, the idea, the, the word is nothing but the syntactic sign of the idea. That is, it's just the sign that I'm agreeing to put always after that idea. But we try to get it to behave like this, to be like about something else that's not part of, not one of my ideas. That's what he means by giving it a secret reference. Well, I mean, why is it secret? I'll talk about that in a second. But we're, but we're giving it a reference to something else. And the two things we try to give it reference to are, number one, the qualities in the external object, and number two, other people's ideas. Um, and those two things Locke says, the first one is what we both mostly try to do with ideas of substances, right? So like I try somehow to make my word goal refer to the type of metal that's in this like ring that I'm holding um, instead of to the like uh, collection of ideas that go up to go to make up my complex idea of goal. That's what I try to do with an idea of a substance, with the idea of a mixed mode, like uh, gratitude. Um, I try to make my word refer to the idea that other people express by their word gratitude. But Locke says this is an abuse. Um, right, so going back to chapter 10 on the abuse of words, chapter 10, section 17, page 444. Fifthly, another abuse of words is the setting them in the place of things which they do or can by no means signify. I guess that's actually about the first of those secret references, not the other, and I read it a little bit wrong. The setting them in the place of things, right? It's thinking that the word is like automatically refers to the thing, but it, it does not and can by no means signify the thing. Um, and I think, like, so why is the reference secret? The reference is a secret because we're trying to cover up our ignorance, basically. <laughs> we're hoping somehow the word will do it for us. So we say, you know, something about gold. We don't really know what gold is. That is, we don't know its inner constitution, right? Like we don't know the, the number, texture, and um, motion, et cetera. The, microscopic particles, how they have to be ordered to make something into gold. Um, but we 
hope the word will somehow somehow refer to that. So that like um whatever that is, that's what our word will mean. Right, and by doing that, we're trying to like cover over the fact that we don't know what gold is. We only know that we try to get certain ideas together. Yellowness, heaviness, whatever. We don't know why. Um, so, uh, So what this means is that this abuse of language is um, it's basically an example of, and this is one of the big modes that Locke most likes to talk about. It's an example of hypocrisy. Locke defines hypocrisy, the mixed mode of hypocrisy as making a show of good qualities, which one has not. <laughs> So when we try to give our words reference, and the case of other people is the same thing, right? It's like, um, I'm not sure exactly what uh, the common understanding of gratitude is. Um, so I'm just hoping my word will stand for it, whatever it may be. Um, It's, I mean, it's interesting that in the later 20th century, some people tried to use these same features of language, but assuming that they were part of the normal and correct operation of language to, to like draw the conclusion that the meaning of a word is not what I have in my mind. It couldn't be what I have in my mind because I intended to refer to what other people use the word for or whatever. So Locke's, you know, Locke's response to that is, well, I intended to do that, but uh, I can't really. <laughs> so I still have to decide when to say it. And if I'm trying to let someone else make that decision or some something in the goal make that decision, it's not going to work. Well, anyway, without trying to, to adjudicate that disagreement, um, um, so this kind of hypocrisy, you know, like if uh, if knowledge is the most useful thing, right? If knowledge is the like, um, hypocrisy is making a show of good qualities which one has not. If knowledge is the best quality you can have, because it's the most useful, and I think Locke does. Although you have to look carefully for the places where he says it, then pretending to knowledge is like the primary form of hypocrisy, which um, suggests that this whole theory is Socratic. Right? Like pretending to know when I don't <laughs> uh, is the worst thing I can do. And sure enough, I think there's an, actually an allusion to Socrates in Book 3, Chapter 10. This is Book 3, Chapter 10, Section 3 on page 438. Um, wisdom, glory, grace, etc. Are words frequent enough in every man's mouth? Right? I mean, so like here's the type of words that Socrates actually asks about. Right? Like he doesn't go around asking people, you know, um, so what is gold? He goes up and says, so what is wisdom? What is courage? <laughs> So anyway, so wisdom, glory, grace, et cetera, are words frequent enough in every man's mouth. But if a great many of those who use them should be asked what they mean by them, they would be at a stand and not know what to answer. 
And I think at a scan is um, Locke's translation of aporia, like the, the state that Socrates induces in his interlocutor, where they where they find themselves unable to answer. Um, right. So. Um, <laughs> Um, so this explains what Socrates is doing. He's going around asking people what they mean by their words. And um, because they don't really mean their words, that is because they haven't really consented them to use them as signs of their own ideas. But have tried to give them a secret reference to something else. They can't. They can't answer. Yeah. Something that kind of confuses me with this, like, I guess, uh, idea is like, we wouldn't know what we're referring to when we say like, knowledge or something like that, right? So if you said the only thing I know is that I know nothing, like, what would that mean? Yeah. Well, I mean. Or is that just too close a connection to the like Socratic thing? Well, so as you know, it's uh, you know the question of what Socrates really knows is, is like uh, you know I mean that's that's one of the hardest things to understand in a dialogue, right? So like. I mean, Locke isn't saying the only thing I know is that I know nothing. Although he is saying the only thing I know is that I know very little, <laughs> right? I mean, that's the moral of this book. And uh, that, you know, um, that so in the Apology, Socrates said that, you know, he found that the artisans and whatever actually did know fine things. Right, but their problem is that they thought because they knew those that they also knew great things, right? Like they also knew the kind of things that like the, the sophists claim to know or, or the pre-Socratics of some kind or other. It's not really sophists. So the pre-Socratics claim to know about the gods and the heavens, and whatever, right? So um, so I think you know that's Locke's interpretation of what Socrates means. Mm. That, Yes, of course, we do have knowledge, and we have um, exactly as not as much knowledge as we need to do our duty as Kant would put it, right? But uh, but uh, when we try to aspire beyond that, we you know we just fall into this kind of gibberish. Okay, I think that's the best I can do answering that. I'm you know I'm not sure I, I agree with. Block and interpretation of Socrates, but I think it's a respectable interpretation. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, so I have, are there more questions about that? Because I'm going to go on to talk about names of substances. It's some of the issue. Yeah. I wanted to know what this would mean for semantic science when two people, like, not just when they're trying to clarify, but when both people are trying to convince someone else that they're meaning so are they both just being the same situation? Well, I mean or, so there is something if you understand what you're doing that according to Locke, there is something you can try to convince someone of. Like you can try to convince them that this is the common use among the educated speakers of our language or something like that. Um, that is, you can you can try to convince them that this is the convention they ought to assent to in order to be socially useful. Um, but yeah, beyond that, he thinks it's just uh, um, useless wrangling, <laughs> right? So, um, um, and he tells a story. I'm not sure if I left this in the assigned reading or not. It tells the story of being with these distinguished medical um, people who are arguing about whether it's actually related to what I was saying before about animal spirits. 
they were they were arguing about whether a liquor runs through the filaments of the neurons. Um, and uh, and he stopped them and, and said, they, they went on for a long time, he says, and he, he stopped them and said, maybe we should try to figure out what we mean by liquor. And then he says, it turned out, of course, we only, we don't know what they thought happened. We have his report, right? <laughs> it turned out that uh, they realized that they disagreed very little about what actually happens in the nerves and their main disagreement was about liquor. <laughs> and he said, once they realized that, they uh, they thought it was a thing not very worth arguing. <laughs> right, so, um, yeah, so I think that's that's the answer. Again, um, I'm not sh sure I agree with Locke about that. I think I don't, but it's not very easy to see why you would. But <laughs> anyways, um, I mean, in philosophy, at least, the question of what is the right term is can be really important. <laughs> um, well, anyway, never mind that. So, um, are there any questions about this? Okay, so now I'm going to talk about names of substances, um, which is really, I mean, of course, it is somehow part of the bigger story, but it has its own little issues. So, um, so we're talking here about. general names of substances. Right, so not proper names, but names like horse or snowball or gold. Um, and um, so the so like there's three things here there's the general name there's the abstract idea um and there's the thing <laughs> okay so like there's the general name gold. There's the abstract idea of gold, which is a complex idea composed of um, various simple ideas like yellow, heavy, and so forth. So, you know, like that means various components. And then there's the thing gold. So the thing gold is like, a bunch of tiny microscopic parts put together in a certain order. And because these parts are in this order, um, it has the power to cause me to perceive the components of this complex idea. Right? I mean, remember, according to, to Locke, that's all there is in external things. It's like the order of the, and motion of the parts. So, if gold has the ability to cause me to perceive these components, it must be because of something about the order of these microscopic parts. So Locke says, this is book three, chapter three, section 15 on page 374. Tis past doubt. There must be some real constitution on which any collection of simple ideas coexisting must depend. So, yeah, all the pieces of gold, that is, all the things that I call gold, that is, all the things that excite the components of this complex idea in me, not necessarily all of them at the same time, but whatever, however that works. Um, if I see one, I can get the others too. Um, all of those things 
must have something in common by virtue of which they excite those ideas and therefore I apply that name to them. The thing they have in common must be something about their internal pieces. Now, I mean, I don't know, is it, is it possible that they have nothing in common and every one of them causes these ideas because of some completely different order of its internal pieces? Maybe, I think, I mean, I think at least Locke would say that's improbable, <laughs> right? So maybe when he says tis past doubt, it doesn't mean it's like a, we have a demonstration. I don't know if you even understand what I'm worrying about here, but right, like I'm saying, you know, presumably there's different orders of microscopic particles that could cause the same ideas in you, or anyway they could be, right? Like there could be two different, completely different explanations for why I get these ideas. So like they would both, so the things that have these two different internal organizations, I would, they would both be yellow, heavy, usable, etc. but for completely different reasons, yeah. Wait, so in, in one of those examples, you're talking about like the arrangement of these like microscopic things. So would that mean that if something was like another thing like at a microscopic level was deconstructed and then reconstructed to be gold it would then be gold or well we would call it gold right i mean that is because yeah if we took all these particles apart and put them back together in the right no we we don't know how to do this right yeah or at least Locke doesn't know we kind of do know how to do it <laughs> but Locke doesn't know how to do this right so like you take all these particles apart put them back together in the right order it will then again cause these ideas. And if it causes these ideas, I'm going to apply the name gold to it, right? So, so it is gold. I mean, that is what we call gold. And this is what Locke is getting at. And I only have a few minutes left, so I'll try to make the main point here. But it being evident that things are ranked under names into sorts or species only as they agree to certain abstract ideas to which we have annexed those names. Um, the, um, the essence of each genus of sort comes to be nothing but that abstract idea which the general or sortal name stands for. These two sorts of essences, I suppose, may not unfitly be termed the one the real and the other the nominal essence. Right, so discounting that weird possibility that I just mentioned that I said Locke thinks probably is at least very improbable. Um, there is something that all the pieces of gold have in common there in their microstructure. That's the real constitution that makes them cause all these effects. And that's what he's calling the real essence. The real, that's the real essence of gold. But he says the real essence of gold is not the essence of the species gold. Because um, we don't sort things into being gold or not gold by examining their real essence. We don't know the real essence. We sort them into gold or not gold by examining the ideas that they cause in us and comparing them to this abstract idea. And if they agree with this abstract idea, we call them gold and otherwise we don't. So this abstract idea is the essence of the species gold. That is, it's the, it's the standard by which you measure whether something's gold or not. And this is what he calls the nominal effect. Um, so, um, right, to put it differently, like the fact that these ideas always come together involuntarily, right? Like, whether I want to or not, the yellow color comes with the heaviness and so on and so forth. 
must be due to some unifying principle in the object of that the real essence. And again, Locke thinks that unifying principle in the object has to be analyzable into an arrangement of microscopic parts. Um, but um, um, But I can't properly make my my words signify that. I can only make it signify the voluntary unity that I put into this idea. Um, well, okay, I'm out of time. Maybe I'll say a little bit about this at the beginning next time. Um, I'll just say, you know, It's for two reasons, actually. One, like I said, we don't know this real essence, but the other, which in a sense is even more important, is that um, all the things that we call gold have do have something in common, yes. But they also have differences between each other, presumably. And they also have some similarities to other things that are not like. That is, these, let's say these are two pieces of gold. Their microstructures are similar in some ways and different in others. And here's gold and something else like brass. So also these are similar in some respects and not enough. So Locke says that even if we knew the real essences, we couldn't use them to sort things into species because the things themselves won't tell us where, where to draw a line. That has to come from us, and we we draw the line when we make an abstract idea and and annex our name to it. All right, like I said, I'll say a little bit more about this at the beginning next time. I guess I'll see you then. Yeah.